Hi everybody, how are you? Today we're going to start our fourth lesson. Um, it'll be our third project and we are going to make some fish. So instead of just cutting a square, we're going to get a little bit creative and the end goal is that in our new school building, we're going to put all of these fish as one big community art project together. And it's going to be a school of fish at school. So now it's time to get your creativity rolling. I went ahead and pre-rolled a slab. So you'll want to start um, getting your piece of clay out and start wedging it, softening it up, and getting it ready to roll out. Now, I actually rolled mine twice because I didn't wedge it well enough the first time and it had little bubbles. Like, see how there's a bubble right there? And see, I'm like pushing the air through. So you can see that they're in there. We don't want those in there. You could even um, pop it and rub it in. So we want to start out on a perfect beginning. So we're going to get our slab perfect. If you have clay stuck to your rolling pin, it's going to make little indents on your slab. Okay. We're going to want to plan ahead a little bit and um, plan our fish. So I want you to get your pencil and you're going to start drawing the outline of your fish before we cut it out. So we're going to cut it out the same way we cut the tile out, but this time it's going to be a more intricate image. So we're going to give ourselves a chance to um, mess up and plan so you're when you're drawing you're going to draw really lightly and you can just rub it out um, if you don't like it so um, in order to make a fish look like a fish we need to know a little bit about them so let's talk a little bit about the physiology and form and anatomy of fish um, you have your typical fish body which everybody knows it's kind of like an eyeball shape. And then, of course, you've got your fish tail. Now, as we're planning, I immediately see that this would be the weak point of my fish. So I would, since we're gonna cut this out, I would definitely make it wider. So the thicker and wider something is, the less likely it's gonna break. That's gonna be its weak point. Um, so you're always thinking about also the limits of the clay as well as what it is you're trying to create. So what are we missing? Um, even if you don't know all the parts of a fish, you intuitively know if they're missing, right? Because you've seen them before. So that's why um, animals are easier to make than humans because um, we know humans really well. So if you see, if you're trying to make a body and it doesn't look right, it's like you just know it doesn't look right even if you don't know why. With animals, we can get away with a little bit more abstractness because we're not as familiar with them. So we're not as um, intuitively knowing when something's wrong, but still you can look at this fish and say, hmm, something's missing. What's missing? The fins, right? So let's talk about all the fins that a fish has. So do you know what this fin is called?
it's called the dorsal fin, right? So like a bottlenose dolphin has a dorsal fin. But our bottlenose dolphins are not fish, right? They're marine mammals. Um, but a shark is a fish. You may um, think you're seeing a shark when you see a bottlenose dolphin. But one way that you can tell is that sharks are fish. So their tail fins stick up like this. So a shark's tail fin kind of goes like this. And so when it's under the water and you're looking out, you're gonna see the tail and the dorsal fin. So when you see a shark, you're gonna see two. At first you might think you see two sharks, um, but really that's its tail fin. So since sharks are fish, their tails are vertically inclined, which means they're going like this when they swim. Now, marine mammals, like a dolphin or a manatee, they're gonna be, um, you know, mermaid style, like a seal, like this, up and down, up and down instead of side to side. So, when you see a dolphin, you're just gonna see that. When you see a shark, you're gonna see both, plus their fins are a little bit kind of more shaped like this, right? They don't have that wave swoop. So, um, We've got the dorsal fin. You don't have to have just one. A lot of fish will have two dorsal fins. They can be spiny or they can be um, soft and flowy. Okay, and then you've got to have some fins down here, right? So you also have a fin down here. This is called the pelvic fin. So that's where the fish's pelvic bone is. And then we've got a second one. This is called the anal fin. Don't laugh, everybody needs one, unless you're a sea urchin. Okay, so we've got these fins, these fins, dorsal, pelvic, anal, and then we've got this one. Does anyone know what this one is called? It's called pectoral. So when you think about your pecs, like working out at the gym, you're like working your arms, right? Your arm muscles. So like if a fish had arms, this would be, you know, like their hand, you know? So um, that is basically where they don't have hands, but they have this pectoral fin that they can flutter here. And then, of course, you've got the tail fin. Um, and this little section right here has this cool joint called the caudal peduncle, which allows it to um, swing back and forth and propel itself. Um, so those are most of the fins. And what else are we missing? We need a mouth, of course. We need some nice big fish lips and we need the eye of course now most fish you're just gonna have one eye um, instead of two right because they are actually usually pretty flat right like they're almost like this slab of clay and so they're gonna have one eye on this side and one eye on this side now why would you want that well if you are really tasty like a fish, you want to see if a predator is coming from either side. Um, that means that fish's brains have to be pretty amazing because they can take in two separate images of two separate things and conceptualize and think about both of them at the same time. So our brains don't work that way. We have binocular vision, and when we see other creatures with binocular vision where their eyes are both pointing forward in one direction, um, we tend to think they're cute because they remind us of, of ourselves. But a lot of other animals have the, this kind of vision, like birds, for example, will have one eye on each side. Um, okay, what else are we missing? So, what makes a fish a fish? 
they can breathe underwater. So they are also going to have gills. Now, if um, this fish was a shark, right, its gills are just going to be open to the water like this. So if you've looked at a shark, you've seen how they have like the gills on the side like that. But most fish have something called a gill flap or a gill cover, and it looks like that. Think about the bluegill, they've got a little blue, beautiful blue sheen on their gill cover. So most fish are going to kind of look like that with their gill cover. All right, um, so once you're happy with your fish, um, we're going to cut it out. But what you can do is, um, you can just erase it if you're not happy with it. So, um, let's say I want to keep the larger version of the tail that I did. Not going to have the waves in there. I'm going to keep the dolphin fin. Okay. So you're going to take your wire tool. Um, or your, um, it could just be a um, paper clip like this. I'm sorry, we live downtown, so we do get lots of jets flying overhead. So if you're wondering what all that commotion is, we've got the jets, we've got weed whackers, all that stuff going on. Um, but just try to listen to the birds and focus on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go along my lines and I'm going to just cut them out. You can also use your pencil for this. Sharp. So after that, it should just peel off, kind of like a cookie cutter. Okay. Okay, so what am I going to do with this scrap over here? Well, I um, could use it since I've already rolled it out, you know? And I can um, cut it, you know, like you would, you could use cookie cutters, you could cut out your own shape. Also, what I've been doing with the scrap is just cutting random shapes, you know. And then putting holes 
so that we can make uh, wind chimes with the younger kids. And so here's some pieces that I've made. And you can tell they sound really nice. They make a nice wind chime. Now this is what happens when you don't score and slip. See, these were on a tile. And you can see that the person didn't score and slip. And they just kind of, they just pop right off, you know? So that's why it's important. Okay, so you can do that if you want with your scraps since you've already rolled it out. Or, you can just squish it up into a ball and I might save a little bit um, for this project, but the rest I'm gonna squish up into a ball. Remember how we said the more surface area it has, the quicker it dries out. So I want to keep it all together. I don't want it just lying around all rolled out like that. And then I'm going to spray it with water or sprinkle some water on it and put it back in the bag. Okay. So if you're feeling lost, you can always um, look on Google, look up um, images of fish. Um, so there's all kinds of unbelievable fish. Um, what I would recommend though, if you have a specific fish you want to make, um, like let's say you want to make a Creval Jack, um, look up, type into Google Images, Creval Jack drawing. I found that sometimes if I look up the actual fish, um, you'll be so amazed by the intricacy and just amazingness of the actual creature if you're looking at a photograph that sometimes that becomes overwhelming if you're trying to translate that into your own uh, clay project and sometimes a simplified people who are good at drawing they know how to simplify things down to the basic things and so sometimes looking at a drawing is easier um, when you're trying to come up with your image. So, in a sense, it's good to have something to sort of look at, to sort of try to copy. Um, now, I know you've been raised um, to say, to believe that copying's wrong, and that's true. I mean, especially with writing, um, that's plagiarism, and that's illegal. Um, but in that case, you're like, not putting something into your own words. You're like just copying it, replicating it. But, um, you know, in essence, even if you were to try to replicate this fish that I'm making and be like, I'm going to make exactly that, I can guarantee you it's not going to come out exactly like this because you're a unique individual and it's going to have you in it no matter how you try. And so... Um, in art, it's, it's okay to have something that you're striving towards and then like, you know, <clears throat> you're going to end up with your own unique thing anyways. I think even Picasso said that all art is a form of copying. I mean, in essence, you're at the very least trying to copy, um, nature, you know, even in our technology and our medicine we're just looking at things in nature like a bird that can fly or a frog that can climb walls and we're going to say how can I replicate that um, mechanically so I can fly too. Um, so it's good to have inspiration is what I'm saying to have like a picture you're looking at. Um, yesterday I made a flounder and I drew a picture so that I could you know have a reference point drawing it out is always a good way. So, um, you may have noticed when I was cutting the fish that I just cut this right off by accident. Um, so, oops, but that's okay. I can score it.
And then I'm also going to score the section where I'm attaching it. So both parts that are going to touch. And then I'm going to get some of this ooey gooey slip. It's the good stuff. Put some on there. Put some there. going to help. And then um, what I'm going to do at this point, since I haven't gotten too far in, is I'm going to make sure my fish isn't stuck, right? So it's a little bit stuck, but I'm going to find the part that comes up easily and peel from there. The wetter it is, the more likely it's going to be to stick. Okay, so I got them loose. Better to do it now than later. So I'm going to have to, since I just scored and slipped this, I've got to make sure it's actually attached. I'm going to meld it, the two pieces, into one. It's always the best thing to do. I could go ahead and sign it now since I'm back here. Okay, and we want to hang this fish on the wall, right? So we want to make sure that it has a hole somewhat in the middle that a nail can go through. So let's stick this through and then push it around to get that hole big enough, like a nail can go through. I don't want any tiny little hole that I can't even get like a thread through. Okay. And we'll flip it back over, make sure the hole went all the way through. You could use something bigger too if that made it easier. Like here's an actual nail. Okay. So I smoothed out the pencil, most of the pencil drawings that I had left. Um, so we're going to do some more advanced texture than just line drawing. Okay, now one thing I should mention is um, when you, if, if you were line drawing, um, don't dig really deep. Like let's say, you know, I think originally I had a line like that. If I had done that line too deep, then even if it stays, it's almost like perforating paper or um, scoring glass to cut a window pane. Like it's gonna break off at that line. So you don't wanna make deep lines. They're gonna be points of weakness where it's gonna be inclined to break. Okay, so um, we have been talking about texture and pattern with our tiles and we want to add texture and pattern to the fish as well. So we don't need anything complicated. Um, just a few little tools here and there. So this is a um, shish kebab skewer and it makes a great tool. You could use this in lieu of the wire tool. 
So you can see that I am, in essence, using this tool to draw, but I'm also taking advantage of its shape. Um, but because I'm using repetition, it still qualifies as pattern. Okay, so we still have the pectoral fin, but I want it, what, what I want to do, what I want to do is um, create a little bit of positive relief. So we've got the negative relief of pushing in the lines, and I want to add some embellishment. So I'm going to take um, some of my extra clay and I'm just going to shape some really nice little fish lips. Now fish are going to have different shaped mouths depending on what kind of things they eat, you know? So, like, if they, um, feed off of the bottom, they might have their lips, you know, pointed down like that. If they kind of feed up from above, it might be the opposite. Um, so, we'll make this guy kind of an above feeder. So I'm gonna score the area. Both sides. And then I'm going to apply some pressure. And then, as I always recommend, I'm going to go even one step farther and just kind of rub the two pieces into each other. So they become like one and you can kind of use your fingers or whatever you feel might work. Okay, now if you have a hard time just hand shaping the lips like that with your fingers, you could just try like cutting out the shape. 
like so like we did originally so like I could draw the pectoral fin and then cut it out a little bit too big so you always want to think about proportion is the proportion correct that pectoral fin it's a little bit too big because I wasn't looking at his body when I made it okay so score and slip Okay, now I don't want to just set, set it on there. I want it to look like it's like part of his body. So I'm going to kind of smooth it in. Went a little bit overboard with the water. Okay, what next? So, we need an eyeball. We're gonna do that the same way we made our sphere. You can roll it between your hands, or you could do it like that. Make it a little bit too big. Take a little bit off. Reduce its mass a little bit. Reroll. Okay, and then I press it down. Still pretty big, kind of exaggerated, but that can make it stylized. So stylized is an art term that just means you're kind of taking liberty. You're not really trying to make it look biologically exact, right? Because it's, it's art after all. And once you sort of know your anatomy, then you can get away with more stylization because if the important aspects are there, you can kind of exaggerate other aspects. We still know it's a fish. Let's see, I might take this pen, which has kind of a cool concentric circle pattern. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm 
make sure that these tips are also connected well. Okay, what's missing? We still need a gill cover. So, most fish have gill covers, not all. Sharks don't, as we talked about. So, that's why um, some people, when they catch them accidentally, they. Um, if the shark is just exhausted from being caught and it's too weak to swim, they'll kind of take it and swish it forward and backward and forward and backward in the water to try to push the oxygen through their gills, right? Because the gills is how they breathe oxygen. And if you're a fish like this, you can just flap your gill flap and you're just like fanning oxygen into your gills. But the shark doesn't have that, so it has to be moving to get oxygen. So, um, it has a hard time if it's too weak to get moving. It can't just slap its gills. So, um, you know, some people just hate sharks so much that when they catch them, even if they're not going to eat them, they just kill them just because they think they're, like, doing a service to humanity. But they're not because we need sharks in our oceans. We need predators everywhere. So the sharks eat the sick fish um, and by doing so they keep disease from spreading and they keep the fish populations healthy. So um, we need predators. You know, it can be scary but if we kill all the mountain lions and all the alligators and all the panthers then you know, Mother Nature's just gonna have to make more viruses to keep our populations manageable and in a healthy, at a healthy level so that everyone can be healthy without getting each other sick. So predators play an important role in keeping us all healthy. So, nothing's permanent until the clay is dry, so you can always kind of change your mind. Probably should have looked at a picture to see, like, where the gills are supposed to be. This is just an imaginary fish. Anyways, okay. So what are we missing? So, um, one thing we didn't talk about that most fish have, which is pretty cool, um, is what's called a lateral line. And it's usually going somewhat down the middle, dividing the top from the bottom. Um, this lateral line is actually super awesome because it has these little sensory pores that um, are really sensitive to movement and they feel when all the other fish in the school are moving. And so that's how when you see like thousands of tiny fish all moving in complete unison and you're just like, how on earth do they all know when to turn left and when to turn right? Well, they're actually feeling each other's motion and they have such an immediate quick response faster than we could ever ma imagine responding to something. And that's so that they look like, instead of a thousand tiny fish, one big huge fish. Because they're all moving in unison. And so they're trying to trick the predators to think that they're just one big giant fish. And typically, 
you'll have kind of um, a darker color above the lateral line and um, a lighter color underneath. Now, why would that be? Why would an animal want to be lighter underneath and darker on top? Well, think about like when you were underwater in a pool or a pond and you went all the way down and looked up, what did you see? When you look at the surface of the water from underneath it, it looks bright, white, or yellow from the sun, right? So a creature is gonna want to camouflage in and be bright, light, right here even yellow like a yellow bellied slider turtle so that it blends in for for creatures that are like looking from underneath like an alligator or something but if you're standing on the edge of a pond and you're looking down it's um, kind of dark and you can't see as well so it doesn't want to be white on top it wants to be dark up here so a lot of times you'll have fish one way down here and another way up top so now I want to add some more pattern. Um, so I am going to add some scales, right? Because all fish have scales. Um, well, most fish have scales. So sharks, again, are an exception. Um, sharks and all the fish in their family, like manta rays and stingrays, um, they, um, don't have scales, and neither do eels, but, um, they have actually what are called denticles, uh, very strange, they're like, actually tooth-like, they're, 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 they're dental tooth structures that are just sticking out of their skin and they're super tiny. That's why when you feel a shark skin, if you've ever felt a shark or a stingray, it feels like sandpaper. So who else has scales in the animal kingdom? Reptiles. So people also believe that birds used to have scales and then they evolved into feathers. Maybe it was the other way around, who knows. See how I wasn't happy with the size of the gill cover, and I just basically sort of removed some of the clay. Make sure that eye is attached. If I want a really smooth surface like I do on an eyeball. You can use water. Okay. So, I think I want to do a different pattern above the lateral line. Let's maybe use 
this cool antique spoon and we'll make the scales just a little bit different. You can see that because I use so much water down here that the stamp is sort of having a different effect. I probably should remove the eye. Put it on after I stamp. Live and learn. could have just left the face um, without scales, like this, it would have been perfectly fine. And your texture doesn't have to be realistic either. Um, your fish does not have to be realistic. This is an excellent use of texture here. Okay, so I'm going to reapply my eye, maybe a little bit stronger this time. Kind of wiggle it and make sure it's, it's attached. And there we have our fish. So I'm going to just do any little repairs. Like it looks like I smushed his dorsal fin there somehow. And I'm going to make sure that he um, comes off the table very carefully, remove him, board to dry. There's the flounder that I made yesterday when I thought I was videotaping myself and wasn't. So I'll teach you guys about ceramics if you teach me how to make videos. 
but you can see flounders are different. They start out with their eyes like one on each side and then the eye goes from the back side and actually migrates around as the fish matures. And so he has two eyes um, on one side of his face. And this one is a summer flounder. So um, they have what are called eye spots. And so I used the little whelk seashell to make the eye spots. Eye spots are common in a lot of animals, like even butterflies and caterpillars. Um, why would they want to have crazy fake eyes? Well, think if this flounder were um, hidden and camouflaged and all you saw was two giant eyes you know you might hesitate and not try to bother the flounder and that's what he's hoping so um i can't wait to see your fish um now you know how to cut out any shape from a slab so what else could you do now that you've made um your pinch pot you've made your slab tiles now you've made your fish so um here is a sunshine face and here is a sunflower face um so basically um we cut out the um flower shape just the same way you cut out the fish shape and then the face is just a pinch pot right so made a pinch pot turned it upside down and then made the face so i can um, do a lesson on some tricks and techniques for making faces if you like but remember the pinch pot is hollow right it's a pinch pot if it wasn't it would be way too heavy and it could explode so your projects should be hollow so then what I did was I rolled the slab, I cut out the sunshine design, and then scored and slipped right here and stuck it on. And then when I made this hole, it is so that it can hang, but also it allows all that air that's inside of this face to escape. So especially if, if I were to just put this on here and not have that hole, it would definitely explode because right there's just like a ball of air inside here so you always want to give the air somewhere to go um, and that that will come up because your pieces have to be hollow so um, you know these things that we're making they will become the building blocks for making um, anything else that you want so thank you for joining me today I can't wait for your school of fish to join this one here, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.